Well, ever since uh, we first came across coronavirus at the uh, back end of last year, the beginning of this year, six months ago, we've all, of course, been looking for a treatment that actually has a big impact on the risk of dying. And uh, today we've announced the, the results of a trial which shows a treatment that reduces the risk of dying for patients who are on ventilators, reduces that risk by a third. And that's the first you know, crack that we've seen, uh, the first uh, time we've seen a drug which will actually improve survival in, in patients with COVID. So that's a significant step forward. Is a treatment, uh, not, a, not a vaccine. Um, do you think uh, it's successful enough as a treatment that uh, the search for a vaccine becomes less crucial now? No, we need, we need both. This is not either or. Um, uh, we need vaccines to prevent anybody getting the disease, prevent everybody getting the disease. But of course, there's still a way off. There's lots of excitement about the development of vaccines. But remember that vaccines are at the most effective when you actually manage to inject them into the arms of millions or possibly even billions of people. And that's a big scale problem. And in the meantime, uh, we do need drugs. We need treatments for the patients who've got coronavirus, have got COVID, are in hospital, are in ventilators today, tomorrow, next week and next month around the world. So as I understand it, Professor, this is only to be used for the most critically ill patients. Why is that? Why can't it be used for more milder cases of COVID-19? Well, the way it works, we think, is that it dampens down the, the inflammatory response, the immune system, if you like. And early on in the disease, you need your immune system to deal with the virus. And that's how many patients, most of us, will then recover. But for the sickest patients, that immune response almost turns against the body, turns against the lungs, causes lung damage. Uh, that's what leads to people needing to have ventilation. That's what leads to people dying. And dexamethasone dampens that. The results are quite clear. In patients on ventilation, uh, we see this big re reduction in the risk. In patients on oxygen, we see the, this reduction in the risk. But in other patients, we do not see any reduction. So this is a treatment for patients in hospital with coronavirus on ventilators or oxygen. So, so my follow-up there is that, that how risky is this? How safe is it? Is it possible that this treatment could actually make things worse and that it, it suppresses your immune system? So the patient that I've described, for those who are on ventilators and those who are on oxygen, the benefits on all causes of death, so total uh, causes of death, are really quite convincing. A reduction of a third for the people on ventilators, a reduction of a fifth for the people who are on oxygen. But for other patients, this is not a treatment. Um, we, the other patients we studied in the hospital who were not on oxygen, it did not work. We did not study patients in the community, in primary care, um, and this is not a, a prevention treatment. This is not prophylaxis. This is not a treatment for the community. This is a, cre a treatment for the sickest patients. But if you had to have a drug and choose where it was going to work, you choose for it to work in the very, in the very high risk group, in the sickest patients. You choose a drug that was widely available in every pharmacy, in every hospital, in pretty much every country. And you choose a drug which was readily affordable uh, to around a dollar a day in the United States, probably a dollar in total in somewhere like India. Where, where is it mainly produced, this drug, and, and what are the supplies like? Uh, I'm no expert in, in, in uh, uh, production, but I understand that the uh, production is relatively straightforward. This treatment's been around for decades. Uh, my understanding is that uh, uh, this is not a drug in short supply. It's on the WHO's essential medicines list. It's in every hospital. It's so different from um, uh, the situation you get when people develop a new treatment and then they have to work out how to manufacture that and distribute it at scale, let alone at an affordable price for the number of people that need to be treated. This is a very, very different problem. Uh, it's a nice problem. Uh, this is a, an easy drug, readily available, readily affordable, with clear results in particular groups of patients. Do you have more optimism, Professor, that other anti-inflammatory drugs like this that are also being used and, and going through trials will be more effective given the results that, that you've seen, anti-arthritis drugs? I think Roche has one in the works. I mean, there are a number of these. Exactly. And we're studying one ourselves. In fact, we're studying one, the, the, the Roche one, tocilizumab, um, which blocks a particular pathway in the sort of immune response. I think this is an encouraging result. I mean, first of all, 
this is an actionable result today, good for patients today. Secondly, it's an encouraging result because to uh, all of us trying to find better treatments, uh, then this gives us hope that tackling the immune system can uh, uh, create these sorts of benefits. But let's think that a cheap drug, widely available, that's going to be first-line therapy. And the question is, do these other drugs now work on top of dexamethasone, on top of low-dose steroids? Um, and that's the question for, for research. We're working on that already. Um, and I'm sure that uh, many others around the world will be uh, uh, joining that endeavor. Professor, will you be publishing the full data set uh, from this trial? And, and, and if so, when? Yes, of course. And um, uh, we get, uh, we've been asked that question a lot, and, and I completely understand why. Uh, yes, we will be publishing the results as quickly as we can. Bear in mind that we're in the middle of a pandemic. This trial to, has only taken three months to go from the very first patient uh, to having thousands of patients and the first answer. But around the world, thousands of patients are uh, dying each day. And when we see that result, the first thing you do when you see a good result is you try and break it. You try and make sure that that result is really robust. We've been through that, that over the past few days. We, then the question is, do you hold on to that result and tell nobody whilst this pandemic is ongoing, or do you at least let everybody else know what you can see, which that's what we've done, and then we are working as fast as we can to getting a publication, as fast as we can to be making the, the full results available. Everybody wants to see that. I want everybody to be able to see that. Uh, but we had this choice to make. Do we hold on to this to ourselves or let others, uh, others take their own view? We're letting others take their own view.